In the early 1900s, a young girl named Dorothy Eady did the impossible, twice. First, she returned from the dead. Second, when she came back, she returned with memories of an ancient Egyptian priestess. It seemed she'd somehow gained an awareness of a distant past life, but how? Well, that question and many more of an equally bizarre caliber will be explored in this video as we check out some of the craziest real-world stories of reincarnation. Born in London in 1904, Dorothy Eady's story really began when she was three. And like most children, she liked to play without a care in the world. That was until a terrible accident changed her life. One day, Dorothy fell headlong down a flight of stairs in her home causing her to lose consciousness and stop breathing. With Dorothy being totally unresponsive, the family doctor pronounced her dead soon after he arrived. After he left, however, Dorothy's parents summoned him straight back to the house. Why? Because their little girl had reawoken alive and healthy. Only, little did they know, Dorothy wasn't the same little girl anymore. She began speaking with a foreign accent and constantly begged her parents to take her home to a different home she couldn't describe. Her parents were baffled and understandably so, but the strangeness was only just beginning. One day, while browsing the artifacts of an Egyptian exhibition, Dorothy pointed at an image of the Temple of Seti I, a pharaoh of the 19th dynasty of Egypt and father of Ramses the Great. She insisted she had lived in that temple, and even went as far as to point out the now-missing gardens that used to flourish there. But Dorothy, being only four, her parents assumed this was merely the overactive imagination of a child. As Dorothy grew older, her insistent belief in her past life led to some uncomfortable situations. One of these included being banned from attending local Catholic church events after she vocally compared Christianity to ancient Egyptian religion which the local clergy determined to be a blasphemous statement. On leaving school at 16, she took up part-time studies at an art institute in Plymouth, where she joined a theater group. There, she played the Egyptian goddess of the moon, Isis, on stage, a role that brought back more memories from her so-called previous life. Now, claiming to be the reincarnation of a girl named Ben Treshet, Dorothy began talking about meeting Seti I in the temple while serving as a priestess of Isis, and how she shortly thereafter became pregnant. Seeing as it was a capital offense for a priestess to be with child, Ventreshit's fling with the king ultimately resulted in her demise. Great story, sure, but was there any truth to it? Well, at 27, Dorothy married an Egyptian man, Imam Abdel Megid, and moved to Egypt with him, setting into motion the most intriguing part of her tale. Though the couple's marriage fell apart after only two years, Dorothy decided to stay in Egypt, where she raised their son, aptly named Seti, and worked assisting archaeologists in their studies. She spent many nights alone in the Great Pyramid of Giza and liked to place offerings at the feet of the Sphinx. In her 50s, Dorothy's story gained an unexpected boost of believability while she was working alongside excavators in Abydos. Shortly after arriving at the Temple of Seti I, Dorothy helped locate the ruins of the lost gardens she had long ago described. What's more, the chief inspector from Egypt's Antiquities Department was blown away when he tested Dorothy's claims by describing to her a series of wall paintings inside the Temple of Seti I. Despite none of the paintings nor descriptions of their locations or appearances having been made accessible to the public, including Dorothy, at that point, Dorothy correctly identified the locations of every single one. Crazy, right? The shortcoming to this report is that no one else beside the inspector witnessed the identification. Plus, having snuck into the pyramids before, who's to say Dorothy didn't sneak into the temple too? Some skeptics suspect Dorothy somehow managed to access the unpublished materials and use them to deceive people. She did, after all, work for the National Department of Antiquities, but that still doesn't explain her discovery of the lost gardens, nor the sudden, drastic changes 
including her accent, after her near-death experience aged three. Even if she suffered from a brain injury that doctors somehow failed to pick up on, her parents' claims about her impossible level of ancient Egyptian knowledge are still difficult to explain away, that is, if the claims were accurate. Some skeptics have argued that Dorothy's parents may have just placed too much significance upon their daughter's fascination with Egypt, unintentionally sending her down a spiral of false belief and possibly blurring their own memories of her childhood. Ancient Egypt was, after all, a hot topic in the early 20th century, so it isn't outside the realms of possibility that Dorothy's peculiarities were merely the product of an intense subconscious obsession with the popular culture of the day. But whether her claims were genuinely proven correct or not, Dorothy spent the rest of her days in Abydos, offering invaluable assistance to archaeologists. She died, for real this time, in 1981, aged 77, in the very place she'd dreamt of since her childhood. Star Power For most people, being the lead singer in a band is pretty cool in itself. But for Sherry Lee Laird, being the lead vocalist in the Canadian rock band Pandemonia is far from the most exciting thing about her. When Sherry was 12, she was wondering aloud about the beauty mark above her lip when her aunt began singing a song. Curious, Sherry asked what the song was, and her aunt revealed it was Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, as sung by Marilyn Monroe in the movie Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Sherry had no idea who Marilyn Monroe was, but hearing her name seemed to trigger something in Sherry's mind. After this fateful moment, Sherry began experiencing vivid dreams and flashbacks in which she experienced snippets of Monroe's life. In these visions, Sherry was Marilyn, and over the years, these experiences left Sherry convinced that she was reliving memories of her past life as the star. These visions often included the moments immediately before Marilyn Monroe's death, which terrified Sherry. After these visions grew severe enough to land Sherry a short stay in a psychiatric hospital with no one to turn to, in 1998, Sherry eventually emailed Adrian Finkelstein, a California-based author schooled in psychiatry. From 1977 to 1980, Finkelstein conducted a research study involving more than 700 regression sessions with volunteers, which involved hypnotizing his subjects to recall their supposed past lives. With the news of Finkelstein's studies reaching as far as Canada, Sherry was hopeful. During one of their earlier sessions, Finkelstein asked the hypnotized Sherry about the night of August 4, 1962, when Marilyn tragically passed away in her Brentwood home, aged 36. Sherry insisted that no one else had been involved in her demise, and that Marilyn simply couldn't go on after President John F. Kennedy broke off their affair. Finkelstein came away convinced of Sherry's story, finding that she was able to answer hundreds of questions about Marilyn's life. Some of these questions, like being able to correctly identify Marilyn's maternal aunts in a photograph, would have taken a total expert to answer, not someone with the casual, conscious knowledge Sherry reportedly had. Finkelstein also pointed out similarities between Sherry and Marilyn's voice patterns and handwriting, and most notably of all, appearance. He had Sherry pose as Marilyn for some photos, which he later used in his book Marilyn Monroe Returns, The Healing of a Soul. And it's pretty hard to deny the resemblance. But despite these similarities, in the field of psychiatry, past life regression sessions aren't considered scientifically legitimate. Critics say the process can lead to patients incurring false memories, often as a result of intentional or unintentional suggestions by the hypnotist. That said, even after she was made aware of this, Sherry remained convinced. So convinced, in fact, she didn't even flinch when Finkelstein suggested that Sherry's own daughter, Keziah, was the reincarnation of Marilyn's mother, Gladys Baker. Do I smell a sequel in the works for Finkelstein? At the rate he's resurrecting dead people, you should consider changing his name to Frankenstein instead. High Flyer Born in 1998 in San Francisco, California, James Leininger was obsessed with airplanes from a young age. 
By the age of two, he knew many models by name, and as his obsession grew, he began having recurring nightmares about crashing a World War II fighter plane. When he was a little older, James told his parents that the pilot in his nightmares was also called James, and even gave a name to the aircraft carrier his dream self had taken off from, the USS Natoma Bay. Childhood imagination, right? Well, things began to get weird when James began displaying seemingly impossible knowledge about aircrafts, like being able to identify very specific technical features, such as fuel storage devices known as drop tanks, by name. His parents began to wonder where he'd gained this technical knowledge, especially since they'd never showed him any plane-related TV programs or books. Baffled by the precision of James's knowledge, his parents grew curious and started looking up the things James mentioned. After rifling through World War II records, they were astounded to find that the subject of James's dreams strongly aligned with a real World War II pilot named James Huston. Who had been stationed on an aircraft carrier named, unbelievably, the USS Natoma Bay. Just like in James Leininger's dreams, James Huston had been fatally shot out of the air over Iwo Jima, an island in Japan during the war. In 2009, the Leiningers released a book promoting James as a real case of reincarnation, titled Soul Survivor, and although they likely believe their own claims, a skeptic can find a few holes in the story. Firstly, the Leininger's evidence is anecdotal, meaning that aside from James's parents, no one else has ever experienced James's claims. Plus, James's mother reportedly reached out to Carol Bowman, an author specializing in reincarnated children, to ask for tips on drawing out her son's past life memories, in hopes of stopping his nightmares. Under Carol's guidance, it's possible the Leiningers were inadvertently feeding James ideas they wanted him to remember. After his vaguer initial dreams inspired the idea, he may have been reincarnated. As for James's technical aircraft knowledge, it's possible he picked it up from TV without his parents knowing. But what do you think? If you believe James was reincarnated, hit that like button. If you're skeptical, hit subscribe. Either way, with fascinating content like this posted on BMAs on the reg, you can't lose. Royal Comeback In 2019, Australian television presenter David Campbell raised a few eyebrows when, in an article for Stellar magazine, he claimed his son was the reincarnation of the beloved and deceased British royal Princess Diana. Apparently, four-year-old Billy regularly made the claim himself. It all started when someone gave Billy's mom a thank you card with Lady Diana on it. When Billy saw it, despite not knowing Diana's real name, he proudly announced it was him, back when he used to be a princess. Then one day in the middle of a conversation with a Scottish friend of theirs, Billy began speaking about his past life, Princess Diana, visiting a castle in Scotland. The castle stood out in Billy's memory, he said, because it had unicorns on it. Here's where it gets crazy. In Scotland, there's a place called Balmoral Castle, which is a holiday home owned by the British royal family, and was actually frequented by Diana. Strangest of all, it is indeed adorned with unicorns. In a separate incident, Billy insisted that when he was the princess, he used to have a brother called John. Sure enough, Diana actually had an infant brother, John, who, even stranger, passed away a year before Diana's birth. With so few people aware of John's existence, it was baffling how Billy just mentioned him like it was general knowledge. The spookiest of all was the day Billy's mom showed him a photo of Diana, leading him to recall the day he heard sirens and stopped being a princess. Could Billy have been referring to the ambulance and police car presence at the site of Diana's fatal accident in 1997? Well, given that David and Lisa are the only witnesses to any of Billy's claims, it all depends on how accurate their story is. If they're telling the truth, could these incidents be coincidences or just blind luck? If it really is just luck, then I hope Billy's considering a career in poker, because he just got a royal flush. Bar Barbro Ann Born in 1954 in Sweden, 
Barbara Carlin was never like other girls her age. Bizarrely, according to her parents, by the time she could speak, she insisted on being called Anne. Her parents, of course, kept calling her by her given name, but little did they know that Barbara's attempts to rename herself were only the beginning. As Barbara learned to write, she constantly shared memories of a previous life and appeared so convinced by them that her parents had her evaluated by a psychologist. Barbara's memories often made people uncomfortable as, on top of causing her to deny her parents were her real parents, they included disturbing visions of men running up the stairs of her past life home and snatching her and her family away. She soon learned to keep these memories to herself, until one day when Barbara was left in disbelief after her school teacher recounted the true story of a girl who'd lived in Amsterdam during World War II, a girl whose story closely resembled Barbara's mysterious memories, a girl by the name of Anne, Anne Frank to be precise, who is, of course, now famous for her posthumously published diary recounting her tragic life cut short by German fascist forces. The overlap between Anne Frank's story and Barbro's memories was too great to ignore, so at the age of 10, Barbro traveled to Amsterdam with her parents, where the famous Anne Frank house marked one of their stops. As they arrived, Barbro quickly noted that they had changed the steps outside, and upon entering the room Anne had stayed in, Barbro freaked out over the pictures that were missing on the wall. When an employee confirmed that there had previously been pictures on that wall, which had been taken down to avoid thefts, it was all Barbro's mother needed to believe her daughter's wild claims of reincarnation. Barbro's mother was so convinced, in fact, she arranged a meeting with Anne Frank's still-living cousin, Buddy Elias. The moment Barbro and Buddy saw each other, they fell into each other's arms and cried. Buddy recognized an undeniable connection between them, and they remained close friends until Buddy passed away in 2015. Barbro's tale is certainly a baffling case. But then again, Anne Frank's diary was published in 1947, meaning the girl's story could have conceivably found its way, through conversation or otherwise, into Barbro's young head, given that she was born in 1954. And little Barbro, having potentially chosen the name Anne at random as a toddler, could have unconsciously latched onto the idea. But considering we don't know for sure, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether a few coincidences or actual full-blown reincarnation is behind Barbro's peculiar story. Far From Home While most cases of mysteriously appearing memories we've seen so far revolve around people who appear to have transferred their identities across the seas of time, this next one concerns memories moving across space. Born in 1996 in Volgograd, Russia, Boriska Kiprianovich was dubbed a genius before most kids could even say mama. Not only did he allegedly start speaking a few months after birth, but his mother claimed that by the age of one and a half, Boriska could already read, draw, and paint. His kindergarten teachers praised his language skills and despite his parents not teaching him anything about space, he would talk about Mars for hours on end. As he got older, his fascination with the red planet grew to such an extent, he started claiming he was originally from there and had been reborn on Earth. According to Bariska, he was sent by the Martians, who have been almost, but not entirely wiped out by nuclear war on Mars, to save humans from destroying their own planet in a similar fashion. Crazy, right? Well, there's more. Bariska says many other children on Earth were sent from Mars, all of which are immortal and stop physically aging by the time they're 35 years old. But perhaps strangest of Bariska's claims, aside from other descriptions he's given of spaceships and propulsion systems, concern human history. Specifically, the ancient Egyptians, who Bariska claims were closely linked with Martian society. Egypt's famous sphinx, Boris claims, can be opened behind the ear, and allegedly hides secrets within that will change humanity forever. The problem is, Boriska can't quite recall how the super-secret opening mechanism is accessed. On top of that, over the years, archaeologists have done extensive investigations of the sphinx, 
and never found any reputable evidence of a significant inner chamber. Perhaps future excavations will reveal more, but for now, it's up to us to decide whether this little Martian is telling the truth. Look who's back. Sergei Anatolyevich Torup was born in 1961 in the city of Krasnodar, Russia. At 18, he enlisted in the Red Army, where he served for several years as both a sergeant and a factory metal worker. Back in the real world, he kept the streets of his local community safe as a patrol officer, before being made redundant in 1989. Having nothing better to do, Sergei turned his attention to methods of exerting psychological influence on people, because that's what everyone does when they're unemployed, right? He attended courses in Moscow and delivered his first sermon from a small TV studio in Siberia. But it wasn't any old sermon. Sergei, having allegedly undergone a spiritual awakening after receiving a message from God, proclaimed himself to be the reincarnation of none other than Jesus Christ. Go big or go home, I guess. Against the backdrop of the disintegration of the USSR, which meant newfound freedom of religion, Sergei had been sprouting ideas about the approaching end of the world, which absolutely entranced people looking for a sense of purpose. Sergei renamed himself Vizarian, meaning he who gives life, and traveled across Russia to gather followers using his calm, charismatic demeanor. By 1994, Vizarian had set up a commune near Mount Sakaya in Siberia, and before long, the Russian Ministry of Justice had officially registered Vizarian's Church of the Last Testament, which combined elements of the Russian Orthodox Church with Buddhism and Apocalyptism, as a legitimate religious organization. Over time, about 5,000 people settled at the commune. It was a tranquil, idyllic community. Or so it seemed. Things began to take a dark turn when Vizarian started to impose prohibitions. Meat was banned, as was all animal protein. This was because, according to Vizarian, every time an animal is slaughtered, an aggressive energy remains in its cells, thus making it inedible. Next, he got rid of sugar, vegetable oil, tea, and a whole number of grains. But that's not all. The members of the commune were forbidden from seeking any medical assistance, leaving all healing up to Vizarian's prayers, and the children were prohibited from attending school. This was justified with the argument that given the supposedly rapid approach of the end of the world, education meant nothing. However, as the years passed, Vizarian spoke less and less about the end of the world, until, finally, people just kind of forgot about it. Still, they didn't leave, because they had nowhere else to go. Little did they know, their secluded little world was about to fall apart. In 2018, government officials opened an investigation into the untimely passing of two infants within the commune. Both children had succumbed to pneumonia, and all because they were forbidden from seeking medical help. After this discovery, a string of legal investigations ensued, uncovering misdeeds ranging from psychological manipulation to property fraud, illegal land use, and deforestation. In September 2020, teams of the Federal Security Service were deployed to the commune, where they arrested Vizarian and his closest council members on charges of inappropriately running a religious organization, with possible additional charges of physical harm to others and extortion. As of now, the leaders remain in custody awaiting trial. I guess we'll see if Vizarian's Jesus Christ superpowers can get him out of this one. It's a twin thing. On a Sunday morning in May 1957, the residents of a small town of Hexham, England, saw a woman driving erratically through the streets. Her out-of-control cruising ended when she crashed into a wall along the sidewalk resulting in the tragically untimely demise of three children on their way to church. The woman was arrested, and the parents of 11-year-old Joanna Pollock, her six-year-old sister Jacqueline, and their friend were left devastated beyond belief. One year later, John and Florence Pollock, Joanna and Jacqueline's parents, welcomed a pair of twins into the world, named Jillian and Jennifer. Immediately, they noticed an eyebrow-raising coincidence. Little Jennifer had two birthmarks, one on her waist and another on her forehead, 
in exactly the same positions as the birthmark and scar Jacqueline had possessed. But that wasn't all. As the twins got older, they began to ask for toys their late sisters had owned, despite having never seen the toys before. And when the twins started familiarly pointing out landmarks their sisters had frequently visited, despite never having visited themselves, their parents started to get weirded out. Especially since, on top of all that, both girls were terribly afraid of cars. Jillian even upped the creepy factor by cradling Jennifer's head one day, and when asked why she was doing it, she insisted a car had hurt her sister there. The twins' parents were soon totally convinced that Joanna and Jacqueline had been reincarnated as their twin sisters. But was that really the case? Skeptics point out that the twins could have absorbed a lot of knowledge about their deceased sisters without even realizing it. After all, they were born a little over a year after the tragedy, when their sister's passing was still a massive emotional force in the Pollock household. There's also the fact that John Pollock had always been a fervent believer in reincarnation. He often prayed for proof that his daughters could return. And when Florence fell pregnant with twins, he was already convinced they were his lost daughters. John and Florence may have been subconsciously looking out for things, be it behaviors, birthmarks, or otherwise, to confirm their hopes, and the twins could have unknowingly internalized their parents' desperate belief in reincarnation. Jillian and Jennifer's past life memories stopped around the age of seven, for the most part, that is. In 1981, 23-year-old Jillian had visions of herself playing in a sandpit in a garden, the description of which perfectly matched the garden of the house the family had lived in when the then-alive Joanna was three, which was, of course, years before Jillian was even born. Was Jillian still receiving snippets of her sister's life, or were her parents taking her words and trying to make them fit their experience? in desperate hopes of a sign from beyond the grave. Well, I'll leave that up to you. Do you believe in reincarnation? And if so, what convinced you? Let me know down in the comments below, and thanks for watching.